joining us now to discuss is Alalua Otsutukan, co-founder and chief technical officer at Lightning Labs. Hello there. Alalua. <laughs> Sorry. Alalua. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, uh, you can call me Lalalua oh, roast beef, nickname, but that was, a, that was definitely a good attempt. Uh, roast beef. <laughs> roast beef. Right. Okay. Roast beef. Okay. So yeah, there's yeah. a lot of growth in Lightning. Um, so mm. what are people using Lightning payments for? most aside from trading services versus what you would like to see adoption for? Uh, no, uh, definitely. I mean, so I think uh, use case that we're seeing uh, lately are kind of like, you know, people using it for things like, you know, gift cards or kind of like exchanging, um, you know, you know, Bitcoin for other, you know, kind of like, you know, digital goods on the internet. Other things include uh, something called like, you know, something called Stacker News, which is kind of like a hacker news, uh, you know, type of clone like Reddit. But like instead of like, you know, doing a upvote, they actually kind of like associate with something you upvote. And that's cool. Because you can actually kind of like earn, you know, money by putting out, you know, cool content on the internet. Because people, whenever they, they do an upvote, you basically get a proportional amount of that. On the other end, we're definitely seeing uh, other use cases related to gaming, you know, as far as like, you know, either doing like some type of Esports type of thing. For example, uh, some people have made this kind of like a Smash Bros. DLC, you know, lightning mashup thing that kind of like lets you actually, um, you know, uh, pay out uh, depending on uh, you know different winners of, of a particular game. We're also generally seeing things as far as like uh, things like um, you know uh, smiles, where you kind of like you know get a uh, like, like a step counter, but actually get paid for lightning over the time as well too. So I think really it's kind of like people you know getting Bitcoin in the hand for the first time uh, generally, but then also kind of like them once they actually have that being in that new lightning environment. I think a bunch of other you know really cool uh, developments come up as far as like you know, making it easier to do lightning on the web. Uh, there's this like a uh, uh, web browser called or Chrome is called Albi that kind of like it lets you kind of like you know have a similar kind of like minimized type experience within the browser itself. I think what that really, really gets going, you know, particularly given the integration we're seeing uh, on applications like you know Cash App and other things as well in the future, it's a lot easier for new consumers to actually you know use Lightning for the first time. And also easier for people to actually deploy Lightning applications because they know that people have like you know pretty well established wallets that they can, they can uh, get their users using. Incredible. Okay, so earlier this month, I didn't know you know how extensive uh, that Lightning was being used. So that's a great. Hmm. Uh, comprehensive explanation there. So earlier this month, Lightning, they announced a $70 million raise and Taro, which is a new protocol for multi-asset Bitcoin uh, and Lightning. So tell us what is Taro and what will it unleash? Uh, good question. Yeah, so you know, us Lightning Labs, we announced our fundraising. Uh, you know, kind of like uh, uh, right before the uh, Bitcoin 2022 conference, I also gave a talk uh, around like Tower and things like that, right? But at a high level, what Tower is is basically another way to like uh, you know issue assets on Bitcoin, right? So you know, people that are watching that prior section, they mentioned something called Omni, which is like something that you know was used in the past. Uh, it's kind of like a very very early on protocol developed in like you know 2014 or so. Uh, this is kind of like a you know you can take a more modern take on it that kind of makes like slight different trade offs, right? So rather than kind of like embedding more data into the chain, we kind of like embed certain uh, you know, commitments basically, or kind of like structured uh, data about like the actual, um, you know, asset descriptions in the top of the tree. And then from there on, we can like build upon that to kind of like, you know, add other rules to say, okay, well, you know, maybe I need the two of two signature, or maybe this is like a collectible, you know, it can't really be split. Uh, maybe this is like something that's very rare. So it's something that, you know, we're definitely really excited about because we think it's going to bring a lot more just general, like, you know, development activity to Bitcoin. Maybe people that went to other chains are going to come back now because they can do things that they want to do on the other end. I think one of the kind of like underlying thing that I'm uh, so hopeful for as well, like related really to that prior session, it's going to also increasing block space demand, right? So as people mentioned before, like, you know, Omni started out on, uh, you know, Bitcoin, but kind of like, you know, the, a lot of the activity went elsewhere, basically, which maybe we're seeing now as far as like, you know, uh, generally like less block space, block space demand, also lower fees, something like this could potentially also kind of increase demand for block space uh, in Bitcoin itself. But at a high level, this lets you kind of like, you know, issue assets on Bitcoin, represent them uh, kind of like as a regular wallet. So the cool part about this is that like, you know, rather than like maintaining like a different type of wallet, like the assets are actually just in your regular Bitcoin uh, outputs, right? So there's kind of like UTXO, which is like, let's say I have like one, you know, Bitcoin, basically. In, in addition to that one Bitcoin, I can also commit to maybe other different assets. Maybe I have, you know, different like collectibles, or maybe I have like other assets, like a stable coin, something like that issued uh, with it as well. And the way we're, we're, we're positioning this as well, too, is that like, you know, it should be pretty easy to like uh, people that are using Lightning or a particular L&D to kind of like, get up to speed as far as like Taro itself, right? So one of the really cool things is like, you know, this is actually able to connect into the Lightning network itself, right? So rather than like actually kind of like having like entirely new network for every single asset, you know, that's possible. And so we're kind of like, you know, using Lightning as like the main, you know, crossing backbone for basically any, you know, concurrency or asset in the world, right? This is really cool because all of a sudden now we're kind of like, you know, we're basically building on top of the network effects of Bitcoin network and Lightning network itself too, to make sure we're able to facilitate those payments. So even if nodes aren't really upgraded and don't really know about this new protocol on the side, you know, this like Taro uh, asset at the edges, they're still going to see kind of like an increased transaction volume and kind of like also increased revenue as well too. So I think it's very cool network effects uh, with the way we're setting things up. Very cool. I think one of the most interesting um, cases was, you know, issuing assets like stable coins on the Bitcoin blockchain. Mm -hmm. Do, are you familiar with companies that are doing that? What, what will that look like going forward? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, really good question. Yeah, so we're talking with uh, you know several companies uh, that are interested uh, you know in issuing uh, you know their own stable coins in the Bitcoin blockchain. I think it's really cool because like you can say like you know stable coins kind of actually started on Bitcoin, right? Like you know Tether was basically the first one that actually directly on Bitcoin. It kind of kind of has gone away to other chains, you know, other like you know chains maybe have like a faster block time, but are inherently less secure. Now I think it's really cool to bring that back to Bitcoin itself, right? I think the cool thing about like uh, you know the way we're doing looking at Taro and particularly in stable coins itself is that like um, you know it's going to be actually directly into the network itself, right? So this actually going to dramatically bring down the cost of people actually you know receiving the stable coins or maybe even using them for exchange transfers as well too, right? And I think it's also kind of like you know, very interesting. We're seeing some additional news for as far as like you know people like Mahler's getting more point of sale systems to actually accept uh, you know Bitcoin uh, you know in like kind of brick and mortar stores. For example, in this case, I could like send Bitcoin on my wallet basically, but they receive uh, you know some like USD stablecoin, right? Or even the other way around. Maybe I have the USD stablecoin already, and I can then send Bitcoin you know in certain terms of the network to, to them as well too, right? But the important part is like you know the assets are actually only at the edges, right? So only the first and last hop actually know about the stablecoin, right? Everyone else in the middle just sees Bitcoin as normal. So everyone's getting paid in Bitcoin as well. Too and like because Bitcoin is still kind of like the core of everything, all the transaction fees are paid in Bitcoin, all the chain fees are paid in, paid in Bitcoin as well too. So I think that really has like a potential to really like supercharge you know adoption as well too because you know in certain uh, you know places that we're seeing Bitcoin beach, people still want that kind of like USD exposure potentially, right? But now like rather than like you're using you know a bunch of other different chains or kind of like something maybe a little more elaborate, it's kind of like still still all in the same application stack as well too, right? So it should look very familiar to somebody. Maybe they have like a, maybe they'll upgrade the wallet and they have a new balance. Basically, everything is going to be the same as far as the same address form or the same invoice you know flow as well too. So really focus on how making sure we're focusing on distribution, also usability, and also working with these uh, people we're working with in the background to make sure we're really delivering, delivering something that's compelling and also like, you know, fits all the use cases. You know, this kind of reminds me of how Michael Saylor says that Bitcoin will be used as the payments rail for the US dollar. Is that, is that kind mm -hmm. of uh, also, you know, where you see this coming from? Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, this is my co-founder. She like coined the quote of like you know Bitcoinizing the dollar. Uh, I think this is really cool because now like we're seeing like Light Network shift away from just kind of like you know being a you can say like a Bitcoin specific you know payment system to kind of like be you know potentially kind of like a you know payment backbone for the entire world, with, right? So for example, like let's say I have like Naira or I have Euro or something like that as well. Maybe I have that at the edges, but and then they, I'm always still crossing through Bitcoin itself, right? So now like rather than mm -hmm. uh, you know people using all these other systems on the side, basically Bitcoin can kind of like basically link everything all together, basically in an off-chain uh, manner that still has like very very low fees, but the same time, it's all fully opt-in, right? So the sun doesn't want exposure to a USD stablecoin or something else. They don't really have to, right? But at the same time, that increased demand for a transactional capacity or kind of like the transaction of the Bitcoin network itself will reflect in the, the capacity of the network itself, but also the actual demand as well, right? So I kind of like predict that if we get you know all the stuff right, we'll see the capacity continue to grow up as a reflection of basically the demand for that new transactional activity. But now it's no longer a function of just the activity of like you know sending and receiving Bitcoin. It's basically kind of cap the activity of like any other asset that can actually plug into the Taro protocol and then you know in turn also plug into the network itself too. So you know, that's kind of like the goal here, basically having Latin Network be this like, you know, agnostic, you know, currency backbone for the entire world. Man, there's so many more questions I have here. We've got to wrap it there, though. Oh, but the last question sure, I, sure. I just got to get out of the way yeah. is why, why is your nickname Roast Beef? Ah, uh, good question. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've been roast beef for like maybe like 15 years or something like that now. Uh, you know, long story short, I was I played a lot of World of Warcraft. Uh, you know, uh, in high school, and I was like making a new account basically, and I was eating a Subway, uh, you know, club sandwich. Every single name was taking all like you know my my typical usernames. And I tried to roast beef with the T. Uh, that was taken. I took off the T, and it's never been taken. And then since like eighth grade up until now, it's never taken. So if you see a roast beef with no T, it's probably me. Every now and then, you know, I have to like you know do something like roast beef blue. I don't have Instagram, so you know, Instagram was roast beef that's that's gonna be great so uh you know shout out on the side i love it i love it you're great thank you thank you so much for joining us